My name is Zamil Solanke. I'm a pharmacist and business strategist based in Brisbane. And once again, joined by my lovely wife, Natasha. Morning, everyone. And just kicking on with our preg pregnancy journey, I guess, but now, you know, really our journey through parenthood sort of series. Uh, we left you guys last time just talking about our birth experience. So I guess the curveballs that we went through during that experience, but at the end of the day, with a really great result, you know, a healthy bub, a healthy mum. And I guess the biggest takeaway from that was that while we had a very you know, I guess a regimented birth plan. We had done a lot of research and things like that. Look, things happen, things pop up. But at the end of the day, the destination was always still the same. So probably one of the biggest takeaways we took from that experience is rather than a plan, you know, look at it like a map, you know, it is a journey. There might be other little pit stops along the way or detours. But as long as we get to that eventual destination, yeah. that's all that matters, you know, um, that both mom and bub came out healthy and, uh, and safe. And uh, so four months on now since that day, yeah, wow. which is crazy. Uh, look, a lot has happened during that time. Sarah's growing up. Uh, super, super quick, you know, and uh, who knows, we might be able to bring her in later during um, the video today, but we'll see how we go. Uh, so where we left off was really talking, starting to talk, I guess, about that postpartum care, you know, what happens after birth, because, you know, we were fortunate enough to go through the, a private hospital and the private sort of system to deliver Syrah and, and give uh, Natasha the experience. And, you know, not that's not for everyone. And we totally respect that, that that is not possible for everyone or well, not even just, you know, some people choose to go down other routes as well. Uh, but what our experience was, and regardless, you know, Natasha did have to stay in, you know, in, in hospital for some post care because she had a C-section, she, she had a cesarean, and uh, as a result needed some afterbirth care as well. Yeah. So kicking off on that, Tash, let's talk about, I guess, what that aftercare sort of looked like. So you had a C-section, and we've covered off in the last video what the epidural yeah. was like, you know, what was their pain and things like that. But, you know, tell us about the first 24 hours, your experience with that, because, you know, it is different for everyone. And the doctors did want to, you know, prescribe a lot of pain relief and things like that to help manage that. But what were your thoughts? How, you know, how did you go through that? Um, you know, to be honest, it was really helpful having you there because there's so much emotion or a support person. Um, for me, it was the mill, um, you know, to help understand exactly what they're telling you. Because honestly, like once you've got Bob, there's just, you know, there's so much going on. You know, it's kind of a bit of relief. There's just this, you know, sometimes, um, you know, kind of just realizing that you actually have a baby with you and letting that sink in. That um, there's so, and you know, after a season when they are talking to you about, you know, pain relief and all this sort of thing, it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. It's really hard to sort of take on board sometimes exactly what they're saying and what that means for you. Um, so, you know, definitely it was helpful having a support person or someone there to help just, you know, translate and, and, you know, kind of remind you or reiterate some of that stuff because, you know, you've just had quite a long journey for some people as well to get to this point that it's just a lot of new information coming at you. But, um, you know, the, it was the a lot of the pain relief, um, making sure that, you know, we had a bed that, um, you, you know, that sort of uh, had the remote that you could sit up and down because you can't really get off for the first 24 hours after your Caesar, just with the scar and healing, just making sure you're lying a bit flat and not, um, you know, just managing... Uh, your movements um, quite a bit so you don't move around anything too much and let everything sort of heal internally. So once we got wheeled back into uh, our, you know, our bed suite for all the, the birth room, um, you know, we delivered in the evening. So we didn't, it was really just a, more of a getting to sleep and sort of working out how to how to manage Syra, you know, how he's going to feed her, like, um, you know, put her to bed. And, you know, that night because I couldn't really get up as much, it really did uh, rely on my support person, Samil throughout the night whenever Syra woke up having to, you know, get up, um, you know, do the diaper changes and pass it to me because I couldn't really jump out of bed when I needed a feeder um, to put her on my chest so I could, you know, go through that. And, you know, one of the good things again about um, our experience at the Wesley was uh, the midwives always being around and being able to call on them at any time of the night. So, um, again, you know, you, you sort of get shown how to breastfeed initially, but you know, when you wake up in the middle of the night for the first time and it's happening every few hours, it can be a little bit overwhelming to suddenly remember what's going on and, you know, is Bob latching right? Is she feeding? Am I having, do I have enough? And just having that support of being able to, you know, talk to Zamil or press the button and have someone come in to just give you a little bit of that comfort. Um, 
that first 24 hours is probably you know really important just having yeah the support around from someone in the room um, and also if you are fortunate enough to be in a position where you've got you know midwives or nurses that you can call on being able to you know, really just utilize that as much as possible yeah so I guess the takeaway from that is is use the resources yeah. you know but not only just use the resources but I guess even before the birth make sure that you've got those su that support network yeah. in place I think that's probably something that you know you even touched on like the first thing you said is starting to talk about support network yeah. and when we I guess look at that that could be family that could be friends and look if those two elements aren't strong in your life you know I guess there's a lot of other avenues that you could reach out towards as well you know have the chat with your healthcare team uh, about the other options available you know and not even just during hospital and we'll touch on this a little bit later uh, I guess about the role of a support team and a support network after you leave hospital as well and for a lot of people that could actually be the same day you know that you know you might yeah. deliver vaginally you might even deliver with a c-section and be forced to you know within 24 48 hours actually depart uh, the hospital so what does your support network look like? Who are they and what roles and responsibilities are you going to give to them to help manage your postpartum journey or your post-birth journey? And I think that's really important is laying those foundations before you go through that because trust me, you're dealing with enough. Yeah. Um, and you know even if you're not the mother even you're the father you know there's a lot going on you know and it can be quite exhausting you know like i mentioned each bub is different and the the the, the change the sudden change in routine the impacts that they have and you know even things like lack of sleep lack of sleep causes enormous stress on uh i guess on a couple on a new family and having a support network there just to help manage in the other things but also being able to openly and honestly communicate with them, telling them what you need, what you don't need is just as important because... I think the expectations here just on, you know, everyone's different and has a... You don't sometimes always know when you're coming out what works for you and what doesn't and it, it can be a bit overwhelming to have some of those conversations once Bob's there yep. with, you know, having the support is good but sometimes there is a line. Yes. Um, and trying to... Have, you know just be aware of it and maybe have some of those conversations beforehand when there's sort of less going on and um, you know the lack of sleep as well causes the stress and there is a lot of emotions I know particularly for me um, you know that I had going up and down and a bit of a roller coaster so kind of navigating some of those more challenging sometimes conversations when that's happening just adds to a bit more of the stress and um, yeah so we mentioned stress now there's a big onus on you know breastfeed a child, breastfeed a child, and look, there's some hospitals around and some, you know, care teams and things like that that place a greater emphasis on this. Uh, our belief is fed is best, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of stress can be put onto a new mother with the expectation to be able to breastfeed. And, you know, at the end of the day, for whatever reason, that might not be possible, you know, and that reason might even just be personal preference or choice. And that's totally fine, you know, at the end of the day, that's totally up to you and that's where fed is best. Um, looking at, I guess, that first day and those first 24 hours, what role did or what impact did stress have on you and, you know, I guess your experience in stress being related to your ability to feed? Um, to be honest, it was huge. I think, you know, we first really noticed it when I was um, expressing colostrum before Syrah arrived and really once she was here, it sort of carried on with, um, you know, my emotions, what I was feeling, uh, you know, the higher my stress was and more emotional I was, it really impacted how much milk I sort of felt and I, my ability to breastfeed, it sort of felt like everything decreased a little bit. and. Once I'd calmed down and was in a you know a better sort of mental and emotional state, even if that's just with you know Zamil kind of just talking to me or reminding me or just sort of helping me, just you know focus my attention somewhere else rather than you know stressing out about trying to feed Syrah, everything kind of worked a little bit better. Um, and again, you know we definitely noticed that with the colostrum when you know, I got a lot more out the calmer I was, and you know, again breastfeeding was exactly the same. And in that 24 hours, just you know being conscious of sort of trying to keep myself calm when I was feeding her going you know it is new I'm you know trying my best uh, you know just talking about it and saying I've got 
you know, I've got enough milk, just kind of a bit more positive affirmations that, you know, Zamil would help me with as well to um, try and make sure that I, I, you know, my body was in a good spot and uh, emotionally and with the stress just getting as much out as I, you know, as I could at that point, which constantly changes as well. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, very important uh, at the end of the day because stress plays, and unfortunately, we go in this vicious cycle. We get stressed, new bugs in the world, then we then we're trying to feed, then we get more stressed, yeah. then less milk production, then we get more stressed, yeah. then less milk production, and it's this vicious cycle. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, when we're looking at stress as a trigger, I guess it's really important to figure out some coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. you know, and some great ones that we touched on even in the past and that we still use today, you know, is breath work, yeah. uh, meditation, relaxation, you know, and coaching yourself not only you know i guess postpartum or post birth but you know that journey leading to birth and putting those routines in place beforehand so you can very quickly recognize those stresses and then ways to then de uh, to regulate those stresses and then bring them down mm -hmm. so to to diffuse those stresses yeah. and i think that plays a, an enormous role not only for the immediate postpartum journey but for all the challenges, all the leaps. Now we're faced, you know, at the end of the day, Sarah, you know, we're very blessed. She's an amazing bub. But she goes through these developmental leaps and it takes, and I see it taking a toll on Tash, you know, and you'll watch this journey as we continue yeah. on through. Uh, and even last night, you know, there were stresses with with Natasha. I had to step out, and, you know, help yeah. out some friends, which was great. You know, more than happy uh, to obviously, you know, and at the end of the day, we have lives, yeah. you know, but... But the stresses involved with uh, Syra, you know, at the end of the day, she's going through a developmental leap at the moment, and it places other types of stress. You know, you think you've you've got it, yeah. and then she changes. You know, um, and it's coaching through that, and whether or not it's you know using affirmations, uh, journaling. Journaling has been huge yeah. for yeah. Natasha. You know, yeah. I've seen a remarkable difference just in journaling. Yeah. Um, and I'll put in the link below one of, uh, I guess, one of uh, the favorite journals yeah. that we use. And I gifted it to <laughs> Natasha, actually, um, for Valentine's Day, actually. Mother's so, Day. Mother's Day, sorry. <laughs> Mother's Day. There you go. There you go. That was it would have been a bit early for <laughs> Valentine's Day. Um, but that's what we want, I guess, at the end of the day, is just to uh, give you some tips and tricks as to how to go through this. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you may have just heard Syra. Syra in the background, so we've got her here now. So Syra, four months old, um, loving life. She just had a swim lesson this morning as well. So uh, yeah, but kicking on from what we were just talking about. So yeah, journaling was definitely a huge, I guess, way to just dump all those mental thoughts onto the paper yeah. and just get it out, you know. Um, so definitely a huge part. So Coming back to, you know, lactation and breastfeeding, what were the biggest things that you found, I guess, uh, yeah, immediately after, you know, uh, delivery, but then also in those first few days, because I guess it changed a lot, didn't it? Yeah, uh, no, definitely. And, you know, I think it, we were very fortunate in the hospital to have access to midwives and different midwives, which I think was, you know, definitely a benefit um, because you got to see the difference in different techniques um, you know whether it was from where people you know were from even if it was just interstate or here or um, you know different ages or generations and the different things that techniques that or tips that they would try to help you out with so um, having access to that was huge um, and, and again you know just calling on that support because initially not even knowing you know how do you hold bulb um, you mm. know to feed like what does it feel like how do you know if you know they've latched correctly or not like how do I know if she's actually drinking my milk or what's happening and you know just having access to you know being able to call on them and um, help them try different things you know what felt comfortable you know and, and different tips to look out for uh, with Syrah when she you know when she did have a correct latch position and um, part of that was uh, one of the midwives was a lactation consultant so we were fortunate enough to have access to that 
um, at, at the Wesley and you know definitely you know if you're having trouble it, it, it does help you know if you need to go see someone after you've been discharged if you don't have that in hospital or um, you know whatever your choice of, of birth was um, it, it was a huge benefit um, seeing her and spending some time just with the different techniques and a, a bit more information that she was able to provide uh, with you know what what sh I should look out for and how to tell if Sarah was latching correctly and you know uh, you know, basic things were just the position of how I was holding her, you know, tell me to mummy, um, you know, with a, how I could support her a bit better with, um, with her head and my elbow, um, you know, the special K sort of kind of trademark with her lips, uh, you know, when she's actually latched correctly, um, just gave me a, li a few things to sort of help me out and feel, make me feel a little bit more confident, like I knew a bit more about what I was doing to help Syra out, really. Um, rather than feeling a bit lost and, and fumbling around, you know, so to speak, uh, which you know you can feel a lot like, and it, it gave me the confidence coming home that after a few days of being able to sort of try the different techniques and sort of found one that I went, okay, this actually like it feels a bit comfortable for me. I can sort of see that Sarah seems to be latching correctly and feeding okay. Um, that coming home and losing a little bit of that support from the midwives I, wasn't as daunting as you know I can imagine it could be. Um, and, and just being able to sort of incorporate that and Samil also being there when um, you know when the midwife was, was sort of teaching me and, and sort of putting this out and taking a video so that we could come back to it if there was a you know a point in time where you know I forgot or it didn't feel right and sort of just have a look at it and, and reference it and sort of help me out and go you know maybe try this or you know she doesn't look like she's you know as flat against your tummy as she should be or whatever it may be that was really beneficial and um, you know coming home in those first you know six to seven days where it's you know they say it takes your milk to come in really um it, it is hard to tell and you know i i you know even beyond that probably till at least you know five six weeks i did find that uh it really does play on your mind as, as a mom who you know if you are breastfeeding how you know because you've got no idea if bub's feeding and how much they're getting and you know what is it meant to feel like when you know they say your milk comes in like how do you know if it's there or if it's not or if you're doing it right so you know the, it, it is a roller coaster and um you know again just coming back to that support network or someone there to sort of help you you know even if it's just some of the information that they told you at hospital there's just so much going on as a mom that having someone there if you can Sometimes it's helpful for them to remember that little bit of information to remind you of something or just, you know, sort of go, actually, it's okay, you know, that's what they said might happen. And you go, oh, okay, actually, yeah, completely forgot about that. Um, but, yeah, I think that that was really the crucial part. And, and just sort of coming back to that stress and Zamil was a key, you know, a key person that I really needed to call upon um, quite a lot in those first few weeks at home to, to help me sort of calm down and you know remember to remember to journal and sort of get that, all those thoughts and that out. Uh, <laughs> and this is how it goes I've done. This is how it goes. Uh, she definitely <laughs> okay. you're okay. So yeah look at the end of the day breastfeeding is definitely one of these things that is trial and error, yeah. you know, you're not expected yeah. to, you know, unfortunately there is some expectations that you need to nail it first go. Yeah, straight away, yeah. And unfortunately, in reality, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, uh, Bub's different, you're different, yeah. your stage and, you know, I guess uh, producing milk is different. I guess the biggest takeaway from that is breathe and persevere, yeah. you know. Just find your happy place, know that your body will, if possible, yeah. you know, obviously there's some, you know, there's some people that phys physically cannot breastfeed. Um, but if you are wishing to breastfeed, don't place so much stress on yourself. It will happen, you know, it yeah. will happen. And if it doesn't, it's okay. Yeah. You know, and that's the biggest thing. If it doesn't, it's okay. Yeah. You know, fed is best and there's a lot of other opportunities and, and ways and, you know, the, the quality of formula now and other, you know, ways to feed, you know, uh, is so amazing. It's come so far. So, look, don't feel like... Uh, and if, if you feel like people are judging you for it, you know, at the end of the day, rely and voice those concerns with your support network, you know, yeah. because at the end of the day, don't internalize that because, once again, the place is more and more stress yeah. on you. And, and, I mean, one of the things that, I, you know, fortunately, I 
didn't have to utilize at the hospital was I know that there is sometimes access to breast pumps. Um, if you do have, you know, challenges with bub latching or, you know, milk production early on, there are sometimes that you can hire, you know, the breast pumps to sort of help you, at, you know, even if it's not initially sort of bub feeding from the breast, but still being able to, you know, help your milk come in and sort of try and, you know, uh, still produce that, that milk and feed bub breast milk while you work on the technique or whatever the challenge may be, um, preventing you at that sort of stage uh, from, from bub being on the breast itself. So, you know, if, if you're not sure or, you know, not aware of it, I, you know, definitely have the conversations beforehand or um, just explore options because, you know, again, it's sort of a bit of a map rather than a, you know, once shoe fits all with, with breastfeeding and just knowing some of these things and some of the, that might help you um, in that journey can be beneficial, even if it's looking at lactation consultants around your area where you live, if there's not one at the hospital that you might have access to, um, can sometimes just be a benefit because it is a bit daunting, you know, in those first days if you do need help, you know, even just leaving the house with Bob, um, you know, if you're not able to drive, if you've had a cesarean, how are you going to get there? And um, sometimes having a bit more of that sort of mapped out can ease that little bit of the burden afterwards. If you do need to call upon it, then you've got a a little bit more of a plan in place than I'm um, feeling a bit lost. <laughs> All right, so we're back. So in a different spot now, so as you can tell, speaking of all this talk about, you know, feeding and all that sort of stuff, definitely, uh, I guess, was, yeah, exactly right. Just getting, getting a bit hungry. But, um, so tell us, Natasha, I guess, you know, so when we've talked about, you know, the first stages of breastfeeding and things like that and using your support network, using the resources of a lactation consultant and things like that. Um, let's talk about post C-section care because at the end of the day, you touched on this briefly, uh, talking about, you know, it was a little bit difficult for you to move and, you know, the pain and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So how, uh, I guess, yeah, tell us about your experience, you know, within the first 24 hours what the doctor sort of offered you and what, you know, your, I guess, process was with, yeah. you know, going through those recommendations. So. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, first up, for me personally, it didn't feel, um, it, it was definitely tender. It wasn't necessarily painful. And I know, like, you know, again, everyone's uh, experience will be different um, with this and, and, and what you feel and what you experience. And they, they were offering quite strong pain relief um, as well, you know, paracetamol as well as a few other um, you know, medications that were a lot stronger um, to, to help ease the pain but um, you know from chatting to you and sort of understanding some of the the impacts that they could have on you you know it was we were in a position where um, I opted to sort of go you know I'll because it's not painful you know honest I still felt like I could sort of move around it was just a bit tender um, that I, I would I would sort of wait to take that pain relief until I really felt like I needed it. Um, you know, the first 24 hours, again, sort of um, bedridden um, with the catheter in just to sort of help you out. Uh, you know, the next morning, um, you know, the nurse would come in and check the wound just to sort of see how it, it was looking and how it was healing. Um, you know, lower the bed, take the catheter out and sort of uh, help you get out of bed. And, you know, being really conscious of your movements, how you get in and out of bed. You know, I know when you're, you're pregnant, uh, there's a lot of information around, you know, lying on your side and how you get out of bed to not put too much pressure on your, your abdominal section and, um, and your movements. And it was really the same after the C-section, pretty much that same sort of motion, uh, you know, rather than just jumping out, sort of slowly maneuvering your legs and kind of pushing yourself up and just having that support so you're not really engaging those lower abs where it is a bit tender and there's a lot that sort of moved around and that scar is. Um, and, you know, for, again, it just sort of being conscious of when you do stand up, just how quickly you're doing it, just to, to really ease into it um, quite a bit. And it, it was definitely, you know, slower, a bit tender, to you know to walk you could feel that something had happened um again for me it wasn't sort of like a, a pain that i couldn't do it but it was definitely a, you were conscious of it and you knew that you had to just shuffle more than anything else i say is probably say the word and um have a little bit of support you know whether it's your the midwife or you know it's a mill in my case just to initially sort of help stand up straight and start to try and work on getting that posture back as soon as possible um what was one of the big things and i think you know i managed the first 24 hours just managed to get through um without needing any sort of pain relief um the second day was probably when it kicked in the most for me 
um, where I needed a you know some paracetamol and some you know muscle relaxants. I think it was just to, yeah, just some anti-inflammatories. Yeah, some anti-inflammatories so. just to sort yeah. of help out. Um, you know, there, there are other things on offer, but I didn't feel I needed them at that stage and thought I'd kind of start with this and see how I progressed, which was enough. But um, you know, once you once you kind of after the C-section as well, you know, some of the things like you've just got to be managing sort of that you're going to the bathroom and sort of you know passing urine and you know stools and that sort of thing just to make sure because everything has literally you know been shoved around to try yeah. and get bub out um and just being aware that if you are being discharged a little bit earlier or depending what your care is um just a bit of information and being aware of some of these things to look out for and you know, ask questions about yeah yep and i think the most important thing is is asking questions mm-hmm. asking questions to the midwives to your prescribing doctors um to whether or not it's you know your obstetrician or your um anesthesiologist what the safety profiles are of the medications that they're recommending not only for the mum but also for the bub particularly if you're looking to breastfeed and that's where i guess i was you know like quite uh quite I wouldn't call it strict but you know I yeah. guess I was I was more involved in those decision making processes because some of those medications do n- not only pass through the milk and then into the bud but can also affect supply as well so uh, they also have you know some of them have side effects with excessive drowsiness and things like that and when you you know you've got a new child on board and things like that uh, you kind of want your energy, <laughs> you know, you kind of want as much energy as you can muster, um, rather than, you know, having potential, you know, I guess side effects from medications, which are, you know, causing you to be overly drowsy and things like that, you know, which... But also add to the stress, I mean, you know, if, yeah. if you're unaware that it's, it could affect your breast milk supply, you know, it just, again, it's the starting point of that potential vicious cycle where, yeah. you, you know, it really could trigger, you know, your potential supply issues and yes. then the stress that comes with that and not yeah. really... If you're taking it for a few days, you yep. know, potentially up to a week. If yep. if you're in hospital, you need it even when you're discharged. You yep. could get offered it. Yeah, um, it, it's yeah. Great example was you know they will offer a type of antihistamine, and you know there's some reports of those types of antihistamines actually you know reducing milk supply. And the reason for that antihistamine is as a potential side effect of like the epidural, epidural and like morphine and things like that. It can cause like a bit of itchy skin. Uh, And I guess the biggest advice that we could give is, you know, and based off our lessons is consider, consider using pharmacological interventions when you need it, not necessarily to prevent something. So, you know, I don't believe you got really overly itchy skin or anything like that. And she didn't require any histamine. Whereas if she used that preventatively, uh, for, for, for something that didn't even happen, it could have actually affected her milk supply. So that's probably the biggest takeaway is when you're having these discussions with your doctor and, you know, utilize your support person to triage this and to ask questions. And at the end of the day, having that good rapport with the healthcare team and asking the questions all in service of ensuring that, you know, your experience is going to be as positive as possible then, you know, there's definitely nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, that healthcare team is there to support you and to educate you to make whatever decisions that you wish to make. Um, But like I said, is, you know, manage your pain effectively, but also manage it, you know, manage it based on what you need. You know, um, at the end of the day, we were offered very strong, very, very strong pain relief, you know, and unfortunately some of those pain relief options also have addictive tendencies and things like that as well. And, you know, it was, it was, you know, very easy to say yes to that, but at the end of the day, that would have just been overkill because Natasha did not require it at all, you know? So at the end of the day, and we've, we've discussed, I guess, the other modalities of, you know, pain relief that we used during the birth and labor process as well. And those still apply because at the end of the day, you know, using acupressure and things like that, they're all different forms of pain relief to uh, reduce yeah. that sensation as well. So we've covered off, you know, I guess, uh, breastfeeding and your experience with lactation. We've covered off, you know, the pain relief side and a little bit of wound care management and things like that. The biggest thing was, is, you know, making sure that, you know, I guess it has sealed properly. Yeah. Um, there were some actual physio sort of stuff as well that yeah. they sort of recommended as well, uh, just to start getting some mobility back. And I think, the most important part of that, and Natasha was definitely one, and I've got plenty of friends that have told us the same, 
is go slow you know you're, you're so keen to get back on your feet yeah. and things like that and yes it definitely has a place but it can also push you a lot further yeah. back you know if you rupture a stitch if you know you're, you try to spring out of bed and things like that follow the advice of the physiotherapist and the care team as to you know how to roll out of bed you know lift mm. push yourself up correctly yeah. and and follow those steps is probably a really you know because there was a day where you know T natasha was feeling great and then the following day she wasn't because yeah. she knew that she had yeah. over yeah overexerted yeah. herself and not that wasn't just in hospital that was also at home yeah. because they the advice we got was about six weeks you know for six weeks you need to be you know taking it a bit easier yeah. and making sure that you're still following those um those principles yeah. yeah and sometimes i think that's just managing your own expectations and the you know mentally coming to terms with that because i you know i would often say to me i'll be like I, you know i feel fine like if i can pick up syra and her weight like you know i'll be okay it's gonna be fine and just sort of being conscious of him going you know that's you know externally you might but again you know internally there's so much going on with you know your all your organs and the healing that needs to take that time and um you know if you do over exert yourself it's only going to make it so much harder to help Syrah and be there or you know for your bub and just being aware of that and again you know i think the expectations that mums can have on themselves for how much they need to be able to do or do on their own or independently and get back um, to exercise you know body yeah. body yeah. you know you know at the end of the day your body still change you know like natasha yeah. four months on is still not at her pre-pregnancy you know yeah. like shape and all that sort of stuff and look it just takes time yeah um, yes, there's people out there that can do it a lot quicker, but you know, at the end of the day, just you listen to your body. Your body. Yeah. And that's the key thing. And I think just giving your time as well to heal, like, you know, six weeks sounds like a long time, but it goes so quickly and there's so much happening with Bob. It's, you know, a good opportunity to try and slow down and really just take the time to, yeah. to you know, to enjoy it as much as you can. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So I guess coming into, I guess what we want to sort of discuss wrapping into wrapping out with the video we've covered yeah breastfeeding you know a bit of postpartum care what that sort of look like um the support network you know and obviously you know the the drug sort of mm -hmm. ma medication management and healing sort of management um when you left hospital and this is what i kind of want to end on today is when you left hospital what was i guess where did you find other support networks and what advice could you give to those watching, to you watching um, right now about how to start to, you know, I guess, assimilate yourself back into some sort of routine, but to also find those support networks out of hospital. So for me, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough that we have a friend circle that there were a few bobs, you know, a few months born before Syra, as well as some that are a bit older. And um, just having that network of being able to just chat or, you know, sometimes even if it was just a message going, I, you know, I don't know if I'm doing something right, like, felt really down today, not feeling like I'm doing a good job or, you know, you know, what is it meant to feel like? I don't know if my milk's come in and just having someone else sometimes that's gone through an experience or just be there and be like, you know, I hear you. I felt that too. You know, it's okay. It's you know, okay to cry. Let it out. Um, was definitely sort of helpful if you do have a friend circle, whether they have bobs or not, but you know, sometimes them just having an outlet for someone who's going to listen to you and, you know, other than your support person that might be at home because it, it sometimes is different. Um, having those conversations and sort of uh, you know what you're feeling and being able to open up in a different way um and for me i you know i, I was very keen on um looking at you know eventually down the track i um, mean you know, i didn't start it then but um you know baby sensory and other classes to get yeah. out, which you know we'll get to eventually so we'll, but, we'll cover um, that next time uh, you know it was one of the things that i found was eventually it was my way of thinking ahead and going, yeah, that's that's another way of trying to find other mums and bubs for support. But, you know, there are government initiatives around that you can kick into and start attending where there are midwives. Um, yeah, so, so there's, well, so. like, we're blessed in Queensland, there's a free, you know, yeah. child health clinics and things like that. So I guess where I was sort of leading towards with this is, is just look in your local area, look through yeah. your socials, you know. I think uh, your, your community Facebook groups, your local mums yeah. and bubs groups, just search for them, you know, but also then use resources from trusted advisors, you know, like at the end of the day, there's so much information out there and a lot of it, to be honest, is really misguided. It's just personal opinions and things like that, which is great. But at the end of the day, you know, try, go to trusted sources yeah. that are going to give you information that's reliable. Um, and a great resource was the Queensland um, Children's Health Book. Yeah. 
And that you can just research, you can just Google that. But I'm actually going to pop a link in the description as well as a great resource to help track. Um, it would, yeah, 100% hands down, yeah. an amazing resource. The other thing, and we're just going to touch on this finally, is uh, what apps would you recommend that have been really, really helpful? Yeah, so I, um, uh, the Ovia app, which is the one that I use, um, help, you know, just track, you know, wet diapers, sleeping times, feeding times, which breast you fed from last. Um, I know uh, there are, it's, it's free as well. Um, the other one that can be quite useful is uh, that I've heard of and sort of used a little bit is Huckleberry. Um, again, the free version, you can pay for other uh, options if you want, but um, you know that, I think the, the difference with Huckleberry is you can kind of track some of, uh, you know, the growth stuff with your bob in terms of height and weight and stuff, if that's important to you. Um, but it, it, for me, it was a, a good way initially early on, especially when the midwives, you know, kind of telling you seven wet diapers or this many, you know, soiled nappies. Uh, yeah, they have metrics. You know, it's kind of metrics box. to kind of yeah. what you potentially could be looking out for. And again, each bob's different, so not to say there's a, you know, an exact number, but um, it was just something else I didn't feel like I had to retain in my head. Um, but you could easily just track on an app that it, when we saw the midwives and they asked about it, um, you know, the post... Um, home care or the GP that I could easily sort of bring it up and be like, okay, actually yeah, things are yeah. looking okay or answer their questions a bit easier rather than trying to rack my brain. And I think you just touched on a really good point there is don't try to box yourself in to what expectations you believe. You know, at the end of the day, if we went by that, our experience would be very different because you try to form the and force these routines on a bub that doesn't necessarily fit into that cookie cutter mold, yeah. you know, and the apps are the same, you know, so, so use them as a source of information and guidance, but don't use them as a source of ultimate truth yeah. because at the end of the day, your child is unique, you're unique. And at the end of the day, the relationship that you have with your baby is your own, you yeah. know, and an app or a book or whatever resource is not going to, you know, I guess, box you into yeah. that. Uh, but as long as they're developing, you know, you know, I guess, great, you know, they're, they're f f hitting all these milestones, then however, like I said, however they get there through their journey or through their mat, yeah. that's their own and that's your own as well. So, uh, so I guess in the next video, what we'd really love to touch on, I guess, is what you know life is like i guess with syrah and what our day-to-day -day routines yeah. sort of look like i guess the resources that we've found to be super helpful along our journey and you know up to you know four months plus now what you know community yeah. initiatives that we've sort of tapped into as well but i guess our experiences with getting a comfortable with you know others you know and and social aspects and things like that yeah. um and we're very blessed you know, being here as well, that we have had the ability to do that in the COVID world that we are right now. But being where we are, we've been very, very blessed to, yeah. I guess, utilize a lot of resources beyond our home. Uh, so that's what we'll probably touch on. And also, yeah, just giving you an update as to, you know, what we found work really, really well, what uh, tools, resources, toys, yeah. Uh, developmental sort of yeah. learnings as well that we've used and techniques. Um, yeah, and that's what we'd, yeah, I guess we'll cover off next time. But look, once again, thank you so much for following us on our journey through parenthood. So we've hit the two parenthood now. <laughs> now we're going through it. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, and we really look forward to seeing you next time. But like I always say, and uh, my final parting thing is please, you know, please share this content. You know, if you want to see more about what we're doing uh, you know, in between these videos as well, because these videos are pretty spread out, but the more day to day stuff is definitely on our other socials on Instagram. Uh, the link is below, but also Facebook as well, where we post up, um, little snippets of, uh, content as well. And then you can be just checking in and seeing what the journey looks yeah. like. Uh, but if you do have any comments, feedback, things that you want to learn about or any questions as well, please definitely put them in the comment section and we'd love to help you through your own journey yeah. as well because that's what this is all about. This is all about normalizing these conversations and just creating, I guess, a dialogue and, and forum for us to have these chats. So that's where we're coming from. We'd love to keep going on this journey with you and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care now. Bye. Bye. Thank you.